Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Mars Keep Out by Frederick Brown Dorningsburg by Wallace West The Arb by Edward W. Ludwig Lake of Fire by Frank Belknap Long Deadline by Walter L. Kleiner Keep Out by Frederick Brown Originally published in Amazing Stories, March 1954 Narrated by Tom Trusser With no more room left on Earth, and with Mars hanging up there empty of life, somebody hit on the plan of starting a colony on the Red Planet. It meant changing the habits and physical structure of the immigrants, but that worked out fine. In fact, every possible factor was covered, except one of the flaws of human nature. Daptine is the secret of it. Adaptine, they called it first, then it got shortened to daptine. It let us adapt. They explained it all to us when we were ten years old. I guess they thought we were too young to understand before then, although we knew a lot of it already. They told us just after we landed on Mars. You're home, children, the head teacher told us after we had gone into the glassite dome they'd built for us there, and he told us there'd been a special lecture for us that evening, an important one that we must all attend. And that evening he told us the whole story and the whys and wherefores. He stood up before us. He had to wear a heated spacesuit and helmet, of course, because the temperature in the dome was uncomfortable for us, but already freezing cold for him, and the air was already too thin for him to breathe. His voice came to us by radio from inside his helmet. Children, he said, you are home. This is Mars, the planet on which you will spend the rest of your lives. You are Martians, the first Martians. You have lived five years on Earth and another five in space. Now you will spend ten years until you are adults in this dome, although toward the end of that time you will be allowed to spend increasingly long periods outdoors. Then you will go forth and make your own homes, live your own lives as Martians. You will intermarry, and your children will breed true. They, too, will be Martians. It is time you were told the history of this great experiment of which each of you is part. Then he told us. Man, he said, had first reached Mars in 1985. It had been uninhabited by intelligent life. There is plenty of plant life and a few varieties of non-flying insects. And he had found it, by terrestrial standards, uninhabitable. Man could survive on Mars only by living inside glassite domes and wearing spacesuits when he went outside for them. Except by day in the warmer seasons it was too cold for him. The air was too thin for him to breathe, and long exposure to sunlight, less filtered of rays harmful to him than on Earth because of the lesser atmosphere, could kill him. The plants were chemically alien to him and he could not eat them. He had to bring all his food from Earth or grow it in hydroponic tanks. For fifty years he had tried to colonize Mars and all his efforts had failed. Besides this dome, which had been built for us, there was only one other outpost, another glassite dome much smaller and less than a mile away. It had looked as though mankind could never spread to the other planets or the solar systems besides Earth, for of all of them Mars was the least inhospitable. If he couldn't live here, then there was no use even trying to colonize the others. And then, in 2034, thirty years ago, a brilliant biochemist named Weymouth had discovered daptine, a miracle drug that worked not on the animal or person on whom it was given, but on the progeny he misconceived during a limited period of time after inoculation. It gave his progeny almost limitless adaptability to changing conditions, provided the changes were made gradually. 
Dr. Weymouth had inoculated and then mated a pair of guinea pigs, had borne a litter of five, and by placing each member of the litter under different and gradually changing conditions, he had obtained amazing results. When they attained maturity, one of those guinea pigs was living comfortably at a temperature of 40 below zero Fahrenheit, another was quite happy at 150 above, a third was thriving on a diet that would have been deadly poison for an ordinary animal, and a fourth was contented under a constant X-ray bombardment that would have killed one of its parents within minutes. Subsequent experiments with many litters show that animals who had been adapted to similar conditions bred true and their progeny was conditioned from birth to live under those conditions. Ten years later, ten years ago, the head teacher told us, you children were born, born of parents carefully selected from those who volunteered for the experiment. And from birth, you have been brought up under carefully controlled and gradually changing conditions. From the time you were born, the air you have breathed has been very gradually thinned and its oxygen content reduced. Your lungs have compensated by becoming much greater in capacity, which is why your chests are so much larger than those of your teachers and attendants. When you are fully mature and are breathing air like that of Mars, the difference will be even greater. Your bodies are growing fur to enable you to stand the increasing cold. You are comfortable now under conditions which would kill ordinary people quickly. Since you were four years old, your nurses and teachers have had to wear special protection to survive conditions that seem normal to you. In another ten years, at maturity, you will be completely acclimated to Mars. Its air will be your air, its food plants your food. Its extremes of temperature will be easy for you to endure, and its median temperatures pleasant to you. Already, because of the five years we spent in space under gradually decreased gravitational pull, the gravity of Mars seems normal to you. It will be your planet to live on and to populate. You are the children of Earth, but you are the first Martians. Of course, we had known a lot of those things already. The last year was the best. By then, the air inside the dome, except for the pressurised parts where our teachers and attendants live, were almost like that outside, and we were allowed out for increasingly long periods. It is good to be in the open. The last few months they relaxed segregation of the sexes so we could begin choosing mates, although they told us there is to be no marriage until after the final day, after our full clearance. Choosing was not difficult in my case. I had made my choice long since, and I'd felt sure that she felt the same way. I was right. Tomorrow is the day of our freedom. Tomorrow we will be Martians. The Martians. Tomorrow we shall take over the planet. Some among us are impatient, have been impatient for weeks now, but wiser counsel prevailed and we are waiting. We have waited twenty years and we can wait until the final day, and tomorrow is the final day. Tomorrow, at a signal, we will kill the teachers and the other earthmen among us before we go forth. They do not suspect, so it will be easy. We have dissimulated for years now, and they do not know how we hate them. They do not know how disgusting and hideous we find them, with their ugly misshapen bodies, so narrow-shouldered and tiny-chested, their weak, sibilant voices that need amplification to carry in a Martian air, and above all, their white, pasty, hairless skins. We shall kill them, and then we shall go and smash the other domes, so all the Earthmen there will die too. If more Earthmen ever come to punish us, we can live and hide in the hills where they'll never find us, and if they try to build more domes here, we'll smash them. We want no more to do with Earth. This is our planet, and we want no aliens. Keep off. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Dorningsburg 
by Wallace West, originally published in Galaxy Magazine, June 1962. Narrated by Tom Trissel. A lean wind wails through the age-old avenues of Dorningsburg. Mornings it brings sand from surrounding hills and scrubs at fresh paint, neon signs endlessly proclaiming the city's synthetic name, and street markers in seven languages. At sunrise it prepares the dunes for footprints of scurrying guided tourists. When icy nights clamps down and the intruders scamper to their hotels, the wind howls as it flings after them a day's collection of paper cups, bottle caps, and other picnic offal. Liars! Cheats! whimpered Betsy O'Reilly as she tossed on the lumpy bed of a third-class room and recalled the sky poster that had hypnotised her. Now Betsy was disappointed and bored, slim, pretty, freckled and pert, but ten years older than she wished. She had mortgaged her secretarial salary to engage once more in the eternal quest. And as always, the quest was proving futile. Eligible bachelors shunned Dorningsburg as they did other expensive tourist traps. The new friends she had made were either loud-mouthed hairy miners en route to or from the Orichalcum diggings, or middle-aged couples on tragic second honeymoons, or self-styled émigré artists and novelists intent on cadging free meals and any other favours that lonely females might grant. But maybe Betsy tried to console herself. There was something real here, something glamorous that she could find and cling to during the long months back in New York, when she would have to subsist on soups and salads in order to pay her debt to Transplan. Mars had been great, the guides insisted. Once, they said, it had even colonised Atlantis. Perhaps under the sham and away from those awful conducted tours, Something was still left that could make her feel a trifle less forlorn. Betsy jumped out of bed and rummaged in a closet. There it was, a heated emergency garment equipped with plastic helmet, air pack and a searchlight. Required by law, but seldom used, since tourists were told to stay off the sixty degree below zero streets at night. Wriggling into the clumsy thing, she tested valves and switches as it had been instructed. Then she tiptoed out of her cubbyhole, down a corridor, and into the hotel lobby. The room clerk did not greet her with its usual trill, a robot built on earth as a stand-in for one of the vanished Martians. It had turned itself off when the last tourists left the dining room for their beds. But how life-life it still looked! balancing on a perch behind the ornate plastic desk. And how human, too, despite the obviously avian ancestry of the race it mimicked. What was it the guides had said about the way in which all intelligent life-forms so far discovered closely resembled one another? Why, even artificial Martians made the average human look drab and clumsy. Betsy circled the over-decorated room like a shadow, and pushed against the street door. Escaping air whistled through the crack. Miss, squawked the clerk, triggered alive by the noise. Don't! She was outside by then, and running through the crazy half-light thrown by Mars's nearer and farther moons. Wind howled and tugged at her. Cold turned the breath from her helmet vent into snow. When no pursuit developed, she stopped, gasping before one of the open-air shops she had toured that afternoon. Five Martians bent stiffly over the lathes and other machines, just where they had stopped after the last visitor departed. Hoarfrost mottled the leather harness. The downy red skins and the scars on their shoulders where atrophied wings had supposedly been amputated. No breath came from their nostrils. How cold and small they looked! On impulse, she approached briskly. Yes, miss, the robot proprietor unclicked as automatic relays turned on. It came forward with a grimace meant to represent a smile. You're out very late. What may I show you? 
His voice was like a rusted bird song. Tell me, said she, what the Martians really made here. Why, we designed jewellery, miss. I have some nice— No, no, she interrupted. What did the real Martians make here? Surely not junk jewellery for tasteless tourists. Something beautiful, it must have been. Wind bells? Dreams? Snowflakes? Please tell me. The robot twittered and flinched like a badly made toy. I do not understand, it ventured at last. I am not programmed to answer such questions. Perhaps the guides can do so. Now may I show you? Thank you, no. She touched the thing's cold six-fingered hand with quick compassion. But I'll ask the guides. Good night. Back in the street, she began to retrace her tour of the afternoon. Here was what the guide had called a typical home. This time she did not disturb the mother, father, and one furry child with budding wings who clustered about what experts thought must have been a telepathic amplifier. It did not work any longer. None but the coarsest Martian machines did. Yet the frost-rhymed robots sat stiffly enchanted before it, as they would do until the sun rose and tourists resumed their endless tramp. The day's last, she noted, had left an empty pop-bottle in the mother's lap. Farther on, she met a policeman, resplendent in metal harness, leaning forlornly against an anachronistic lamp-post. Some late-prowling jokester had stuck a cigarette between its still lips. Surely not policemen here. She looked up at the fairy towers that laced the stars. Surely not in this grave place. It must be one of those human touches introduced by transplanetary to make tourists smile and feel superior. Nevertheless, she removed the cigarette and ground it under her heel. After walking half a mile through the sand-whipped night, Betsy paused before a structure of translucent spires and flying buttresses where a library had once been housed. No robots were on duty there, and no serious attempt had been made at restoration. No Champollion had appeared in the early days of exploration to decipher some Martian Rosetta Stone, and by now the historical record had been hopelessly scrambled by souvenir hunters. But that didn't matter, really, they said. Outside of the tourist trade, the only really valuable thing on the dying planet were extensive deposits of orichalcum, an ore rich in pure radium. Thanks to the impartial mining monopoly established by Transplanetary twenty years ago, orichalcum supplied the nations of Earth with sinews of war which they had not yet dared use, and fuel for ships that were questing greedily farther and farther out into the darkness of space. So metal-paged books had long vanished from the library's stacks, and its sand-strewn halls were littered with broken rolls of tape, how long would it be, she wondered, as she passed on with a sigh, before the guides realised that even those mute tapes could be sold as souvenirs? Phobos had set by now. She turned on the searchlight, checked her air tank. The gauge showed enough reserve for another hour, and defiantly opened the faceplate of her helmet. The atmosphere was cold, cold as a naked blade. It had a heady tang, and she stood taking in great gulps of it until a warning dizziness forced her to close the plate. The guides were wrong again. A human could learn to breathe this air. Leaving the gutted library, Betsy breasted the wind as she ploughed through shifting dunes toward a structure shimmering on the other side of the plaza. This, the guides patted, was a cathedral. When the place now called Dorningsburg had been alive, they said, its inhabitants gathered at the shrine each evening to sip one ceremonial drink of precious water, shed two ceremonial tears for the days when a Mars had been young, and worship a flock of atavistic winged princesses who performed ceremonial flights under a pressurised transparent dome in the rays of the setting sun. This showplace had of course, been restored right down to its last perch, and had been equipped with a full complement of worshippers, 
At the climax of each day's final guided tour, visitors jammed themselves into the nave, sipped cocktails, oohed and ahed, and even shed tears along with the robots as they gawked at mannequins flying above them on invisible wires in the best Peter Pan tradition. Ducking under an electric eye that would have started a performance, Betsy tiptoed into the structure. It was quieter than any grave. Several hundred robots huddled there on their perches, drinks in hand, ready to go into their act. At the far end of the transept, a soaring mural, gleaming phosphorescently, hinted at the lakes, seas and forests of Mars's prehistory. Under the dome a single flyer dangled, its plumes trailing. For long minutes Betsy stood in the dimness, seeking to capture the mystery and wonder of this place. In ruins it would have swept her with ecstasy, as had her moonlit view of the Parthenon. Restored and repopulated, it made her sick and ashamed of her race. Now, not of her race exactly, but of the few hucksters who debased its thirst for knowledge and beauty. Then a bird started to sing. A bird? On Mars? This must be a tape, triggered on somehow, despite her care in avoiding the electric eye. Any moment now, the robots would begin their mindless worship. She shuddered and turned to escape. But something held her. She crept instead, step by soundless step, toward the source of that exquisite music. An almost naked male robot had materialized before the mural. It was singing, far better than any nightingale, its strange hands outstretched through the radiance. Such notes could not, should not, spring from the throat of a machine. Heart in mouth, Betsy advanced with infinite care. By the mural's light she saw that the newcomer had no hoar-frost coating, and the moisture of its breath condensed and fell to the floor like a blessing. She reached out a small hand to touch its scarred shoulder, then jerked back. The shoulder was warm. "'Greetings, girl,' Betsy's brain whispered to her. "'You're out late. Just let me finish this thing and we'll have a chat.' The music soared, uninterrupted, to a climax sparkling with grace notes and glittering with chromatic trills. "'Now!' fluted the creature, turning and fixing her with golden free-wheeling eyes. What brings a tourist? The word was a curse. Here at this hour. L love she gulped, hardly knowing what she said. I, I mean, I wanted to find out if anything real was left. And, well, I ran away from the hotel. They'll be coming after me, I suppose. Don't fret. Martians can play tricks with time. I'll return you to your room well before they get here. You're, you're not just another fancier robot? I'm alive enough, he bowed with a sweep that seemed to invest him with wings. Pitteret Murra, at your service, a princeling of sorts, an iconoclast, and an atavist like you. "'There are others here?' her eyes grew round. "'Most of the others had finished with this outgrown eyrie "'and are away on larger affairs. "'Only I return with a few friends once each year "'to sing of past glories and weep over present desecrations.' Two ceremonial tears?' she asked with a return of bitterness. "'There was something in his attitude that she found disquieting.' Many more than two, but, he shrugged angrily, I grow tired of weeping. On this visit I plan to wipe out your little humans who foul the nest of my ancestors. How? she gripped his arm, fear racing through her. Tomorrow all this junk, he nodded his handsome head at the robots, 
will have been replaced by real Martians, youngsters out for a lark with me. We'll tend shop, make jewellery and all that until I give a signal. Perhaps this shrine will be the best place when it's crowded, just at sunset. Then we pounce. Mura ruffled himself up and sprang at her so convincingly that she shrieked. How juvenile! she managed to laugh shakily. What did you say, human? The pitarette was taken aback by this unexpected thrust. I said your plan is childish, she stamped her foot, so you cut the throats of a few stupid people. Then Earth sends up cobalt bombs and blows its cradle of Martian civilization to smithereens. The others won't like that, even if they are occupied with larger affairs. You would be in real trouble. Hmm. He looked at her with new respect and a faint tinge of uncertainty. But some punishment is justified. Even you can see that. Yes, she admitted, wrinkling her nose at him, now that the worst was over. This place is a horror, and we tourists are horrors too, for having let ourselves be taken in by it. But death isn't punishment, just an ending. I hadn't thought of it that way. Mura slipped an arm around her shoulders and looked down at her impishly. You suggest a fitting punishment, then. Here was the final test. If she could keep the hold that she had somehow gained over this immature superman, horrible things might be averted. Her thoughts raced in circles. Martians can play tricks with time, she asked at last. Oh, yes. Time is like this mural. Let me show you. Aim your light at the left-hand corner of the picture. See the sun and its planets forming out of cosmic dust? Now move the beam toward the right, slowly, slowly. Notice how Martian oceans form and living things crawl out of them. Now continue. There you see the winged Martians with their cities that long have crumbled to dust. Next, water grows scarce and canals are built. Here all but a few of us have lost our wings. Here we colonize Earth, to our eternal regret. Finally, you see us abandon Mars rather than risk another test of strength with you pushing troglodytes. I, I don't understand, she whispered, strangely moved. That searchline beam represents the living present. Where it shines, life pulses briefly on a vast mural that is painted across time, from its beginning to its end. Martians manipulate the light of the present as we please, living when we please, as long as we please. How dreadful, wonderful, I mean, she gazed at him worshipfully. And you can do this for humans, too? For short periods, yes. But stop fluttering your lovely eyelashes at me. Punished you are going to be. If you can suggest nothing better than my plan, I'll go back to it and take the consequences. Otherwise, I'll be the laughing stock of my friends. And you couldn't stand that, could you, poor boy? She patted his hand before he snatched it away. How is this, then, for an alternative? Tonight, when I couldn't sleep, I got to thinking that there could be no more fitting punishment for tourists than to be forced to live for years and years in a plush hotel at Atlantic City, Las Vegas, or Dorningsburg. Think how miserable they would become if they had to take the same tours over and over with the same guides, stuff themselves on the same meals, dance to the same orchestras with the same new friends. Can you hold your time spotlight still here for, say, ten years? Of course, Mura crowed as he swept her into his downy arms and danced her about among the robot perches. A wonderful idea. You're a genius. Even the others may come back now to watch humans squirm, yawn, and perhaps learn to respect their elders. How can I repay you? Let me go back to New York, she said, 
feeling like a traitor. That wouldn't be fair. You're a tourist. You came here to prove to yourself that, as your Bible puts it, a living dog is better than a dead lion. You must learn your lessons along with others. I suppose you're right. She felt cleaner now, even though the prospect of a decade at Dorningsburg, with a quest unfinished, appalled her. To be forty-one and still single when she returned to earth, two tears trickled down her freckled nose. That's better, the pitterette sang happily. You are ready to begin to understand the meaning of our ancient ceremonial. Give me ten years, and I'll make a real Martian of you. Outside, the lean wind echoed his glee as it tossed a hatful of good humour sticks and sand coated lollipops against the cathedral wall. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Arb by Edward W. Ludwig Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, February 1955 Narrated by Tom Trussell The cool Martian wind crept across the rust-red expanse of desert. Occasionally its soft touch stirred the thorny leaves of devil's eggs, the squat black plants which peppered the silent monotony. Here and there a wisp of sand spiralled upward into the bright thin morning. The wind felt clean and new on Monk O'Hara's coarse, blond-stubbled face. He chuckled as noisily as a man buried neck-deep in sand can chuckle. "'Nothing to worry about,' he muttered. "'Not a goddamn thing.' It was uncomfortable, of course. No man would relish being beaten by hysterical Martian tribesmen, spat on, and buried to roast in the hundred-degree Martian noon or freeze in the fifty-below-zero night. Yet the summer wind from the melting polar ice cap will ensure an endurable temperature through the day. Monk's lungs, enlarged and sensitized after two years of prospecting for devil's egg seed, were accustomed to the planet's scant atmosphere. Destruction of his oxygen mask presented no menace. Idiots, he mumbled. The fool Martians made off with a sand car like kids with ice cream, and left enough egg seeds to buy a thousand cars. He was able to turn his head just enough to glimpse the heavy, fat sacks that the tribesmen had dumped out of the sand car. The sacks bulged with a fine black seed that, properly processed, made the deadliest, costliest, and most habit-forming narcotic in the system. The sacks were symbols of a shining future for Monk O'Hara, symbols of fine clothes, beauteous women, choice whiskey, and most important of all, a return to earth. Of course, it was too bad about the old man. The white-bearded, toothpick-slim Martian trader and his black-haired daughter had pitched their tent next to his cap last night. The girl had been amazingly full-bodied for a Martian. Her round, firm body and sensual lips made him suspect that she was a half-breed, a delightful combination of Martian grace and earthly sultriness. Monk smiled as he saw her again in his mind's vision. She slid off her antelope-like lozelle, came to him slowly with her small naked feet swishing through the sand. "'It is all right for us to camp by you?' she asked, her eyes wide. "'We will not bother you?' "'Not at all,' Monk answered his heart pounding. After all, it had been six months since he'd even seen a woman, any kind of woman. "'What is your name?' the girl asked. "'Monk, they call me. Monk O'Hara.' He could feel the blood pulsing through his temples. "'I am Thule,' she curtsied. "'You like me?' "'Yeah,' Monk breathed. "'I like you a lot.' Later, through the ports of his sandcar, he watched her lithe movements as she and her father set up their tent. Throughout the night his sleep was thin and restless, his mind on fire with a vision of the dark, lovely face. So early this morning he'd gone to her again. 
How about some coffee, kid? Got plenty in the sand car. She crinkled her nose teasingly. Yes, I like earth coffee. My book will come too. Now, just you, kid. Your old man's busy taking down the tent. She nodded eagerly, smiling. Yes, I come. I like you. What greater invitation did a man need? But in the sand car the little fool screamed. The old Martian darted into the car, yanked Monk away from Thule, and descended on him like an enraged beast. Monk hadn't meant to kill the old Martian. He meant only to silence his shrill screams and stop the frenzied flailings of his fists. How could he have known that a thin neck would snap like a rotten stick under his first blow? Monk's smile faded. No, he thought. He hadn't acted too wisely. He'd expected the frightened girl to leap out of the sankar and race away on under Zell. And she had. But he hadn't expected her to return an hour later with a dozen revenge-hungry tribesmen. His mistake had been in letting her escape. He cursed silently. Then he spat. After all, it was over and done. The Martians had trust him, buried him, and left him to die. But he'd at least been wise enough not to reveal his ace in the hole. His partner, old Stardust Luke, had left yesterday in the auxiliary sand claw to get fresh supplies from Chandler Field. Old Stardust was as honest as a baby and methodical as a clock. He'd returned today, late in the afternoon, just as he'd done a dozen times. There was no doubt about the punctual arrival of Stardust, and Stardust would save him before the freezing descent of the Martian night. Monk thought for a moment, then chuckled again. His glee more than overshadowed the inconvenience of his neck-deep burial for the rescue would be the last good deed of Stardust Luke's life. In fact, it would be his last deed, period. The old space rat had outlived his usefulness. If he persisted in wandering over unexplored Martian terrain, he'd probably end up in a freezing or sweltering grave anyway. So it wouldn't be murder, not exactly. It would only be giving a bit of impetus to what already seemed inevitable. Monk strained his neck muscles to gaze at the sacks of seed. They would all be his soon. Not half, as now, but all. He sucked the cool air deep into his lungs. Everything's gonna be okay, he murmured. No, not okay, but perfect. He closed his eyes at peace with the universe. He could forget the pressure of sand on his chest forget the heat that was beginning to shower down on his thick, sweat-matted mop of hair. He could imagine himself in a cool, dark bar on earth, surrounded by smiling women, sipping iced drinks. Ah, he breathed, opening his eyes. Then he saw the arb. It squatted on a small, irregular-shaped dune some three feet from him in the jagged, sharp-edged shadow of a devil's egg. Its eyes like shiny pinheads of obsidian, were on a level with his. It was a red-scaled creature, about three inches long, combining the most significant characteristics of an earth crab and an earth ant. Its claws were tiny, razor-edged traps on the ends of wire-thin appendages. Even at this distance, Monk saw that his mouth was open, whether in awe or in anticipation of a meal he did not know. The arb rose on its six rear legs as if trying to stretch its dark red body into a position of better vision. It rubbed its foreclaws together, sharpening them perhaps, Monk shivered. For the first time since his arrival on Mars twelve years ago, Monk felt fear. Till now he'd met no adversary that his strong, bull-necked body could not subdue. Ordinarily, he disposed of an arb by squishing stump of his boot, and he'd flower the naked grave with a squirt of tobacco juice. But now it was as if he were bodiless. His broad shoulders, sinewy arms, and barrel chest seemed buried a thousand miles deep in the very bowels of the planet. He was a helpless freak, 
a living sliced off head on an endless platter of red sand. Fear was an icy bauble in his mind, rising, swelling, forcing out all other thought. Go away, he yelled. The ab's claws fell to the sand. Monk saw the menacing glint of the needle-like tongue in the creature's black open mouth. Arbs were carnivorous, he knew. They especially relished the soft, tender places of the human body, the lips, eyes, tongue. Ten minutes of attack by a hundred arbs would transform a man into a white, clean skeleton. About the bones, the arbs would lie prostrate, too stuffed to move their bodies swollen to thrice their normal size. "'Get out of here!' he screamed. The arb retreated a few inches, backing into the shadow of the devil's egg. "'Go on, and keep going!' The arb turned and began to creep away. It responded readily to Monk's commands. For arbs were gifted with a rudimentary, if unpredictable, type of telepathy. No interplanetary circus were complete without its complement of the deadly creatures controlled by an expert human telepath. The arb continued to needle a path through the sand. It passed through the shadow of the devil's egg. It was now some six feet from Monk, a tiny red ball half buried in the desert. Suddenly a thought echoed in Monk's mind, ever so faintly, like the barely distinguishable sound of trickling water far away. I will come back. Many of us will come. Monk paled. Damn, he'd forgotten. The Arbs, according to biological reports, sent out scouts in search of food. The Arb before him was a scout. The fear welled up within him, stronger than ever. His body was held motionless in his tight prison, yet inside him he was trembling. No, don't go, come back! He repeated the words over and over in his mind, knowing that the Arb would respond only to the mental impulse, not to the sound of words. Abs were deaf to the human voice. The Arb paused. Don't go, don't, don't! Slowly, like a revolving wheel, the Arb turned. Its black pinhead eyes seemed to bore into monks. I'm going, you cannot stop me. The thoughts, not words, filtered into Monk's consciousness. You are not going, Monk telepathed. He gritted his teeth, funneling all his strength into the mental command. The arb was struggling to break away from the hypnotic chain. Its body was grotesquely twisted, its claws digging into the sand, its head bobbing absurdly. Let me go. Let me go. You can't go. I've got you. Let me go. Let me go. The arb struggled furiously. Damn you. I won't let you go. Monk hurled the thought at the creature in a fire of desperate fury. The arb fell, exhausted. Ten, fifteen minutes passed. The wind blew. The hot Martian sun transformed the desert into a sea of glittering scarlet. A mist of sand settled on the inert body of the Arb, camouflaging it. How many minutes more till the arrival of Stardust Luke? It must be close to noon. There will be perhaps five more hours. Sixty minutes in an hour, and five hours. The Arb stirred. It began to rise. Monk concentrated on the thought. You can't move. I've got you. You can't rise. The arb stopped rising. Monk licked the perspiration from his upper lip in a futile effort to quench his thirst. But there was nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. His head jerked back. The arb was rising again. It was defying his last command. Monk bit his lip. Of course. His mind was tiring just as muscles tire. He couldn't hope to hold the arb here all afternoon. The arb, somehow, must be disposed of. But how? Out of the heat, out of his fear and desperation, came a plan. It was simple and direct. 
It gave Monk his only chance for survival. He quickly pressed it into the depth of his unconscious mind so that the arb would not detect it. Come here, he said. I won't hurt you. You will hurt me. You will dispose of me. Monk cursed. Arbs weren't intelligent, but they possessed some reasoning power. No, I won't hurt you, he telepathed. Come here. Let me see what you look like. I am afraid. You have a plan. This time Monk relaxed. He tried to emanate only thoughts of love and friendliness. I won't hurt you, I promise. The Arb hesitated. I command you to come here. You will not be hurt. Slowly the Arb crawled forward. One inch, two, three, six, a dozen. It was only five feet from him now, and in the shadow of the devil's egg again. That's it. Come on, closer. I'm afraid of you. Let me go. Let me go get the others. The arb suddenly bricked his advance by digging its foreclaws into the sand. But you don't want to go back to the others. Monk's lips quivered as he spoke. His words to human ears would have been unintelligible. You want to stay here. You want to come closer to me. His attempt at telepathic hypnotism brought a small, silent reply. I must call the others. It is my duty to call the others. The others are hungry. A shudder passed through Monk's hot, tight body. A few minutes ago he had delighted in the coolness of the desert. Now the heat seemed to be pressing down upon him like the fiery hand of Satan. You're a scout, aren't you? he asked. You find food for the others. You go back and tell the others what you found. I tell the others. The others are hungry. But you're hungry too. Why share what you've found? Why not take it all for yourself? No reply appeared in Monk's mind. He continued. Come closer. Look at me. You're hungry. You're too hungry to waste time calling the others. The arb came closer. It passed out of the shadow of the devil's egg. It came to within two feet of Monk. It crossed the small dune. Slowly, slowly, its legs laboured through the thin sand. At last it stopped some six inches from Monk's face. It appeared immense, like a lumbering, scaly giant from the planet's billion year ago past. It rubbed its claws together, threateningly. Its black mouth opened, closed, opened, closed. Its needle tongue twisted like a silver slake. I am hungry, came the thought, so very hungry, but I should call the others. Combined fear and hope hung over Monk like an omnipresent shower of fire and ice. Sweat dripped into his hot eyes, obscuring his vision. He opened his mouth. Look, he said, you are hungry. He wriggled his tongue as a fisherman would cast out bait. Hungry, 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 came the tiny voice. An eternity passed. Monk's heart was a monstrous hammer pounding in the depths of his body and in the depths of the planet. The arb was motionless save for the restless, uncertain moving and blinking of its eyes. Then its forelegs lifted. It drew itself forward. One inch, two, three, four, five, six. Monk beckoned the creature on with his wriggling, twisting tongue. That's it, he telepathed. Closer, closer. The arb entered Monk's open mouth. Crunch. Monk chewed and spat and chewed and spat. He grimaced hideously. He coughed and choked. The arb tasted like a combination of paprika and oil. He thought he was going to retch, but did not. And it was over. Monk breathed the cool air. His weary mind thought of the stupid white-bearded Martian and of his lovely daughter. He thought of what he was going to do to that idiot space rack, Stardust Luke. His gaze travelled to the empty red desert where in about four hours Stardust Sandcar would appear. It shifted to the sacks of priceless devil's egg seed 
and he began to chuckle. And last, his gaze turned to the black pinpoint eyes and the moving foreclaws of the two arbs which squatted some three feet away from him in the jagged, sharp-edged shadow of a devil's egg. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Lake of Fire by Frank Belknap Long Originally published in Planet Stories, May 1951 Narrated by Tom Drusser Steve found the mirror in the great northwestern desert. It was lying half buried in the sand, and the wind howled in fury over it, and when he bent to pick it up, the sun smote him like a shining blade, dividing his tall body into blinding light and wavering shadow. I knew it was a Martian mirror before he straightened. The craftsman's ship was breathtaking, and could not have been duplicated on earth. It was shaped like an ordinary hand mirror, but its glass surface was like a lake of fire with depth beyond depth to it, and the jewels sparkling at its rim were a deep aquamarine which seemed to transmute the sun-glow into shimmering bands of starlight. I could have told Steve that such mirrors by their very nature were destructive. When a man carries a hopeless vision of loveliness about with him, when he lives with that vision night and day, he ceases to be the undisputed master of his own destiny. "'She's alive, Jim,' Steve said. "'A woman dead fifty thousand years. A woman from a civilization that flourished before the dawn of human history.' "'Take it easy, Steve,' I warned. "'The Martian simply knew how to preserve every aspect of a mirrored image. "'Say how do you do to her, if you'd like. "'Press your lips to the glass and see what happens. "'But don't mistake an imitation of life for the real thing.' "'And an imitation of life?' Steve flared. "'Man, she just smiled at me. "'She's aware of us, I tell you.' "'Sure she is. "'Her brain was mirrored, too.' every aspect of its electrodynamic structure preserved forever by a science that's lost forever. Get a grip on yourself, Steve. I was hot and tired and dusty. My throat was parched, and I didn't feel much like arguing with him. But I had my reasons for being stubborn. Men have found Martian mirrors, and got mad, I said. Don't take any chances, Steve. We don't know yet what it's rigged with. Why not play it safe? A thousand cycles of direct current should melt it down. Melt her down? Steve's eyes narrowed in sudden fury. Why, it would be murder! Steve got up and brushed sand from his knees. He held the mirror up so that the red Martian sunlight caught and aureoled the splendour of a face that offered a man no chance of help if he ever let go. A pale, beautiful face the eyes fringed with long dark lashes, the lips parted in a mocking smile. A living image capable of mercurial changes of mood, a naturally still one moment, smiling and animated the next. One thing at a time, I thought. Don't drive him too hard. Some men have carried them about for years, I said. But just remember what falling in love with an image can mean. You'll never hold her in her arms, Steve, and compulsions can kill. She is alive as flesh and blood is alive, he said, glaring at me. Easy, Steve. I could see that I was going to have trouble with my stout-hearted buddy, Captain Stephen Claymore. He could have stared at a mountain of gold unmoved. He could have knelt with a wry chuckle and let a handful of diamonds trickle through his wiry bronzed knuckled hands in utter contempt for what diamonds could buy on earth. He could have thrown back his head and laughed at wealth, at glory, at anything you want to name that men prize highly on earth. But a beautiful woman was a temptation apart. A beautiful woman. Steve grabbed my arm. Look out, Tom, he cried. Watch it. The bullet whizzed past like a heat-maddened insect, 
Steve leapt back, and I flattened myself. The attack was no great surprise. When people take up a new way of life, when they pull up stakes and go striding into the sunrise, strife paces after like a ravenous hound, red tongue lolling. When the first colonists from Earth swarmed into the crumbling Martian cities, a good third of them ended up in stony desolation where their hearts drilled through. They danced to riotous tunes, calling for louder music and stronger wine, and they fought savagely to set up little kingdoms of tyranny eighty feet square. Everywhere anarchy reigned, and haggard-eyed desperate men crouched behind smoke-blackened ruins and held off other men as greedy as themselves. They fought and died by dozens, by hundreds, their minds inflamed by the quickly made discovery that the Martian cities were vast treasure troves. You had to go prospecting, you had to search, and when you found your own shining treasure, you didn't want to share it with any man alive. Steve had his gun trained on the wall ahead when he ducked down at my side. Yes, sir, I whispered half to myself, this is going to be rough. They asked for it, Steve said. His gun roared twice. From the wall ahead came a burst of gunfire in reply. If they think they're going to get this mirror away from me, I looked at his grim, sweat-beaded face. I'll help you fight for it, I said. So nice of you, he grunted. Then maybe you'll have sense enough to bury it face down in the sand. Guns went off thirty feet directly in front of us. Red sand gazed up, granite cracked and splintered. You could feel the awful heat of the blazing exchange of bullets. I could see faces between the chinks, malignant faces moving from peephole to peephole like scavenger birds hopping about in the desert. I was aiming at one of the peepholes when Steve groaned and sagged against me. His gun arm sagged, and I could see that a bullet had pierced his shoulder high up. "'I'm sorry, Tom,' he whispered hoarsely. "'I was careless. Damn it!' "'Never mind, Steve,' I said. "'Now they'll close in and get you. Better take my gun. You can use two guns.' "'I won't need two guns, Steve,' I said. "'I'm walking into the open with my hands raised. "'You're crazy!' he breathed, his eyes on my face. We're outnumbered five to one. They'll drop you the instant you step out from behind this wall. My gun was hot and smoking. I smiled and tossed it to the sand. I'll be back in a minute and fix up that shoulder, I said. You'll be walking to your death, he said. They've been trailing us for days, hoping we'd stumble on something. They must have seen me pick up that mirror. They trailed us because they thought we looked experienced, rugged, I said. They thought we were following a map. They just haven't got what it takes to go prospecting for themselves. They're hyenas of the desert, Steve. All right, hyenas. That means they won't respect a white flag. If you walk out with your hands raised, they'll burn you down before you've taken five steps. I steadied my helmet and unloosed my collar so that I wouldn't feel cramped. Don't worry, Steve, I said. I knew they saw me the instant I stepped out from behind the wall. The silence was ominous, and I could feel their eyes upon me, hot and deadly. I didn't raise my hands. It didn't seem quite right to let them think I was seeking a truce. A man may be a fool to play fair with killers, but something made me change my mind about raising my hands. I'd give them their chance— ten seconds. I wouldn't try to bargain for those ten seconds by walking toward them under false colours. I just trust to luck, and— Steve had never seen the weapon I held in my palm. It was a tiny electrostatic accelerator tube, capable of flexible, high-precision control of ions with energies up to twelve million electron volts. It was a simple thing, and unbelievably destructive. It made no sound at all. But ten seconds after I clicked it on, the desert directly in my path was glowing white-hot. Just a glow, white, dazzling for an instant. 
Then a dull rumbling shook the ground, and the wall opposite blackened and crumbled. The heat was like a blast of incandescent helium gas from a man-made sun. I turned and walked back to where Steve was lying. I didn't want to do it that way, I said, but I had no choice. It was them or us. Steve seemed not to realise we were no longer in danger. There was fear in his eyes, and he was staring at me as if I'd just returned from the dead. In a way I had. A man may die fifty deaths while counting off ten seconds in his mind. I'll give you something to help you sleep, Steve, I said. It didn't take me long to dress and bind up his wound. He winced once or twice, but he never took his eyes from the mirror. You promised to bury it face down in the sand, I said. He looked at me. You know better than that, he said. I promise nothing of the sort. It's like falling in love with a ghost, only worse, I said. That's where you're wrong. There's nothing ghostly about her. I mixed him a sleeping draught, using the little water we had left. In five minutes he was snoring. I pried the mirror from his fingers and propped it up against a rock so that he could see her face when he woke up. Then I stretched myself out in the sand, kicked off my shoes, and stared up at the sky. The sun was just sinking to rest, and there was a thin sprinkling of stars in the middle of the sky. The stars seemed cold and immeasurably remote. Would it work out? Could it possibly work out? Was I sticking out my neck in a gamble so big it was like attempting to pierce the sun and hammer out a new humanity on a great blazing anvil heated to millions of degrees centigrade? I laughed, alone with my thoughts. Nothing dared, nothing gained. What does a man gain by striking bargains with a mouse in himself? I awoke in the cool dawn. The morning mists had rolled back, and the red desert looked almost beautiful in the sun-glow. Steve was sitting up, staring at the mirror. The light shifted suddenly, and I could see the radiance which smouldered in the depth of the glass. I got up, walked to the wall, and peered over Steve's shoulder. The girl was looking at him, her face so beautiful it fairly took my breath away. It was as though, after a lifetime of wondering, she'd found the only man in the world for her. Her face was bright with sympathy, with compassion for Steve. But Steve sat slumped in utter dejection, his eyes burning holes in his face. He didn't even look up when I spoke to him. "'She knows, Tom,' he whispered hoarsely. "'She turned pale when that bullet hit me. She was relieved when you dressed the wound. She's been watching over me all night, like an angel of mercy. You'll need her more and more, I said. You know what the end will be, Steve. Complete hopelessness in an empty room. He stood up, his face savage. I never asked your advice, he ground out. I'm not asking it now. I've got to save you, Steve, I said. I love her, do you hear? I don't care what happens to me. I picked up the mirror before he could guess my purpose. I swung about, and I brought that rare and beautiful object down on the rock Steve had been sitting on. There was a splintering crash, a crackling burst of white flame. Steve gave a great despairing cry. He stood for an instant, staring down at the shattered fragments of the mirror. Then he came at me like a charging bull, his eyes bloodshot. I clipped him lightly on the jaw. "'That's all I wanted to know, Steve,' I said. "'Thanks, pal.' I looked down at him, lying in a crumpled heap at my feet. I was glad he hadn't fallen on his wounded side. He was plenty sturdy, and he came from a long-lived family, and I didn't think a little clip on the jaw could hurt him. I hoped he'd forgive me when he woke up. That was important, because I thought a lot of Steve. When you've been to Mars, 
when you fought your way through the red and raging dust storms, and laboured beneath the naked glare of the sun, and juggled with men and ships and supplies like some tremendous Herculean figure in the morning of the world, you'll never really feel at home on earth. You'll see the world of ordinary men and women as a vision of Lilliput, too small to be measurable in terms of human worth. You'll be lost and helpless, blind and staggering beneath the weight of a memory you can't throw off. A memory of bigness, too much bigness, integrated into your every fibre, as much a part of you as the beating of your heart. You'll lurch and overreach yourself. You'll never feel at home on earth, never really at home. You'll find a way to come back to Mars. I smiled down at Steve. So Steve had come back to go prospecting, like an ordinary greed-driven man, and only I knew he was one of the scant dozen great constructive geniuses who had made possible man's conquest of space. He was an engineer, a physicist, and a man in need of a partner. So I just stepped up and introduced myself. Tom Gearson, who knew every square foot of Mars. For my purpose, one Earth name was as good as another, and Tom Gearson had a sturdy ring. Hard-bitten Tom Gearson, bronzed by the harsh Martian sunlight, as much as home in the desert as the sturdy little spiked plants that thrust their way up through the parched soil when the springs begins to break. Steve's finest achievement was years in the past, but he was a young man still, with a young man's need of a woman as great as himself to share every moment of his waking life. That woman was waiting for him, but I had to be sure that he'd really go berserk if I smashed the glass. I was sure now. I raised my arm, and out of the ruins the Martians came. Steady hands lifted Steve up, and a hushed silence ringed Steve round. Azala, I said, where is she? Then I saw her. She was advancing straight toward me through the glare of sunset on desert sand, a shining eagerness in her eyes. The girl of the mirror, young and straight and alive, her hair the colour of red sand and sunset glow, her eyes twin dark stars. She paused before me and raised her eyes in questioning wonder. Go to him, I said. He will never love another woman, I can promise you that. She ran to Steve with a little glad cry and fell to her knees beside him. I wanted to break through the circle and slap Steve on the back and wish him all the happiness on Mars the first Earthian to wed a Martian. And it was tremendous, and I wanted to tell Steve. But how could I tell him that Martians had numerous ways of watching Earthians, the very best being mirrors which were really two-way televisual instruments? How could I tell him that the alert Martian women all had been trained to watch and observe Earthians day and night, and all the while the Earthians thought they were carrying about with them, in beautiful jewelled artefacts of a dead culture, the living images of their heart's desire. Steve was awake now, and sitting up straight, and the image was warm and alive in his arms. But how could I make Steve understand? I had a wild impulse to say, I'd change places with you if I could, Steve. She's just about the cutest kid I know. You get to thinking that way when you've mingled with Earthians around desert campfires, studying them as you'd study a new neighbour who comes knocking at your door, the neighbour you fear at first, and are never quite sure of until you really get to know and like him. You see, we had so much to offer one another, a young race, constructive, brawling, shouting its defiance to the stars, and an old race, imaginative, sensitive, heirs to a civilization on the wane, but needing just a few Steves to make it young and great again. I'd picked Steve, because he was one of the shining ones of Earth. 
I had known from the start that persuading him to wed a Martian woman would take plenty of doing. Earthians are funny that way. Love to them is a complex thing, a web that has to be skillfully woven right from the start. Beauty alone isn't enough. You have to say to them, you'll never hold that woman in your arms. Can't you see how hopeless it is? Then the iron goes deep. If a love flies straight in the teeth of despair and comes out all right in the end, it will be as strong as death. So I'd arranged for Steve to stumble on the mirror, to pick up that two-way televisual circuit into a very special paradise for two, and I'd opposed and warned him just to make sure he'd think of himself as a man facing hopeless odds to win through to an undying love. On the other side it was easier. Azala had fallen in love with Steve before we put her on the other end of that televisual circuit. But seeing him wounded, and in need of her, had turned it into what Erthians called a great love. Perhaps Erthians would some day smash the aura that had flamed about the heads of the Martian rulers for fifty thousand years. I'd done my best to smash it. I'd gone simply and humbly among Erthians, seeking a fresh wind to trundle the cinders of a dying culture. I dreamed of Martians and Erthians standing equal and strong and proud, hands linked in friendship, cemented by bonds of kinship, separated by no gulfs such as now yawned before me, separating me from Steve. I wanted to shout, "'Good luck, Steve, Azala! You're good kids, and you deserve the best!' Then I remembered that Steve was nearly forty, not quite a kid by Earthian standards. But looking at Azala, I was pretty sure that Steve still had his best years ahead of him. I wanted to go up to him and shake his hands for the last time. But now the hands of my people were tugging at my shoulders, stripping off the Earthian garments I'd worn so long with scant respect for my desire to be as human and regular as the next guy. They got the suit off, and then I saw the old familiar cloak, purple and billowing out with shimmering star images, and I shuddered a little, because I knew I'd never really feel at ease wearing it from that moment on. They got me into the cloak, and they bent down and straightened the stiff imperial folds, and I was suddenly bored and deathly weary. A chill wind from the stars seemed to blow over me, but I stood straight and still, and allowed them to fasten on the cloak, the great glowing jewel I'd worn from childhood. Steve saw me then. He was sitting up very straight, his hand on Azala's tumbled red-gold hair, and I heard him say, Holy smoke! I stared down at the jewel, blazing and shuddering and shivering in the desert air, and I shut my eyes tight, wishing for the first time in my life that it did not proclaim me, Tulan Sham, the glorious one, temporal ruler of the seven cities before whom the stars bowed. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Deadline by Walter L. Kleiner Originally published in Infinity, September 1957 Narrated by Tom Trissel Helen Dolanley handed me a cup of coffee, but didn't pour one for herself. I could feel her eyes on me as I drank. Finally, she said, For God's sake, Marsh, you could say something. I could, yeah. As the implications penetrated, the coffee slopped over the rim of the cup. I emptied it quickly and gave it back to her. How about a refill? She refilled it and gave it back to me. If we haven't got a chance, she said slowly, I've got as much right to know as you do, Marsh. Have we got any chance? I set the coffee down and stood up. 
I shrugged and spread my hands. Ask me that seventy days from now, if you're still around to ask, and I'm still around to answer. Then maybe I can tell you yes. Right now, I just don't know. This wasn't included in the plans. She didn't answer. I walked forward and stared out over the crushed cab at the blue-white co 2 ice of the Martian North Polar Cap. Seventy days. That was the deadline. The physical deadline. It really didn't matter too much. Mechanically, we'd either make it to the equator and carve out a landing strip for the other two ships, or we wouldn't. We might make that deadline and still miss the other one, the psychological one. My wife was dead. So was Helena's husband. So were the Travises and the Leonards. That left just me and Helena. And according to the reasonably well-proven theories of space crew psychology, she would have to replace my wife and I, her husband. It was supposed to be easy, since we wouldn't have been in the same crew if we weren't known to be more compatible than ninety-nine and nine-tenths percent of the world's married couples. I pictured her in my mind, and tried to superimpose wife on the image. It didn't work. I gave it up. Maybe later. It had all happened so fast. Four days ago, the eight ships of Joint Martian Expedition 1 had gone into orbit around Mars. Four men and four women in each ship. Forty of the most stable marriages discoverable at the present state of the research, which had resulted in using the stabilising influence of marriage to stabilise space crews. Three of those ships were equipped with the streamlined nose shells and wings necessary to make actual landings on Mars. Number one, my ship, was supposed to make the first landing on skis near the edge of the North Polar Cap. We carried a pair of double-unit sand tractors, each of which had quarters for four in the front section and carried a featherweight bulldozer on the trailer. We were supposed to report a safe landing by radio, proceed overland to the equator, and carve out a landing strip in 70 days. If the radio didn't work, we were to touch off the remaining fuel in our tanks, after we had everything clear of the blast area. Right now, a mile or so behind us, the drives and fuel tanks of Number 1 were sending merging columns of smoke high into the thin Martian air. A magnificent signal. Only, we hadn't touched them off. And they couldn't have ignited on contact and still be going like that. They couldn't have gone much before Helen and I came to, about seven hours after we hit. About half a mile in front of us, one of the bulldozers lay on its side. A short distance from the wreck of the nose section, slashed open where the tractor had come through it diagonally, missing Helena and myself by inches. The dozer, the wingtips, and the tractor unit which we had climbed into were the only things left remotely intact. It was a real, genuine, gold-plated miracle. I didn't know how it had happened, or why. It occurred at the first shock of landing, and that was the last either of us remembered. Maybe one of the skis collapsed. Maybe one of the drives surged when I cut it back. Maybe there was a rock hidden under the ice. Maybe the ice wasn't thick enough. Maybe a lot of things we'd never know. It was small comfort to be sure that according to both the instruments and the seat of my pants, there was nothing wrong with my piloting. That didn't matter. Sixty more people would very probably die if we didn't do the probably impossible. The other ships wouldn't have enough fuel to pull up and get back in orbit if they came down and discovered that the landing strip wasn't there. So now what? Helena finally broke the long silence. We've looked around and picked up enough pieces to maybe get us there. You're the boss. You know how you want to do it. But I've got to help you. 
How about letting me in on the secret? I swore silently at the guy who had decided that the younger half of the crews should be conditioned to look to the older half for leadership in emergencies. In space, you don't want leadership. You want coordination and automatic cooperation. OK, I said, not turning. I'll tell you. But are you sure you'd rather not remain in blissful ignorance? I regretted the sarcasm instantly. I'm old enough to know the facts of death. I'll take your word for it, kid. Hell, you already know. Six thousand miles. Seventy days. With just two of us, it'll probably take thirty of them to hack out a strip. It's simple arithmetic. I know that, Marsh. But what do we do about it? Get some sleep. Then we'll pick up what pieces we can find and jury-rig anything we can't find pieces of. When we find out how much fuel we've got, we can figure out how fast we dare travel. We should be able to find all we can carry. The tanks were self-sealing. When we're sure we've got it all, we take another eight hours sleep and pull out. From then on, we run around the clock, ten hours on and ten off, until something blows up. If anything does, we're probably done. So maybe we've got one chance in fifty. Maybe one in a hundred. A thousand. A million. It doesn't matter much. Let's get our sleep, and while we're at it, we might try praying a little. This is a time for it, if there ever was one. She was silent a moment, then said, You know, Marsh, you haven't told me a thing I didn't know. I nodded. I'm sorry. I'd almost hoped you might know some way out that I haven't been around long enough to pick up. I didn't answer. I didn't have to. I'd said enough for a month already, and we both knew it. My speech left an odd feeling in the pit of my stomach. Space crews are not selecting for the talkativeness. In space, there is next to nothing to talk about, and a large part of pre-space training consists of developing the ability to be silent. Another part consists of eliminating as much as possible of the remaining necessity for talking. So many words meaning so little amounted almost to blasphemy, but somehow the situation had seemed to call for them. It was not a situation normally encountered by space crews. The sounds behind me said that she was unfolding the beds, inflating the mattresses, and then slowly stripping off the three layers of her spacesuit skin. I waited until I heard the peculiar snap she always made when she removed the inner layer, then turned and began removing my own spacesuit. Space crews are normally nude when the situation does not require spacesuits. It saves weight. I watched her closely as she hung up the suit and crawled slowly between the covers and tried to feel something remotely resembling passion. I remained as cold as the thin Martian air on the other side of the rubber fabric envelope around us. I gave up the attempt, and tried to convince myself that desire would come later, when we got things organised better and the shock wore off. After all, that had also been included in our training. I shrugged off the rest of my suit and hung it up carefully, strictly from force of habit, and slid into the bunk below hers. I couldn't sleep. I could relax a little, but I couldn't sleep. I've been in space a long time. Eleven years, and five years in training before that. I flew the third ship around the moon, and the second to land on it. I flew one-sixth of the material that built Lee, the first stepping-stone satellite, and one-twentieth of those that went into Goddard, the second. I didn't bother keeping track of how much of Lunar City got there in my ship. I flew the first and last ship around Venus, and brought back the report that settled that mystery. Dust. Those were the old days. The days of two-couple crews and the old faithful Canfield Class three-steppers. 
the cans. The days, too, of the satellite hopping von Braun's, each of which consisted of a Canfield crew can stuck on the end of a 600 foot winged javelin with two dozen times the cargo space of a Canfield. The super cans. Just four of us then myself and Mary, and Ted and Belle Leonard, four who might have just as well have been one. Then Mars. Not that we were ready for it, just that it was a financial necessity to the rest of the project, with Venus eliminated from the picture. Taxes kept us in space. The scientific value of Lee and Goddard and Lunar City wasn't enough for the tax-paying public. They didn't want ice cream. They wanted a chocolate sundae with all the trimmings. Apparently, a public relations people couldn't tell them that the fact that we could get that far in eight years without an accident did not necessarily mean that we were in a position to shoot for Mars. So we shot for Mars. Ships were no problem, of course. A Canfield could have made it from Goddard to Mars and back and wouldn't even have needed its third stage to do it. We got the first seven of the new Lowell-class Ball and Girder space-only ships, the Cannonballs, and modified the daylights out of three old von Braun's for landing purposes. The crew was the joker. We had to have forty people trained specifically to make the observations and investigations that would justify the trip. Most of the operating crews either didn't have enough training or lacked it entirely. The crews that had started training when we first saw this jump coming weren't ready to be trusted farther than Lee. So we set up four couple crews, too old, too new, much against our better judgment. It worked out better than anybody had seriously expected, but somehow, even after three years in the same can, eight never became quite as nearly one as four had been. Helena Dollarly wasn't sleeping much either. Not a sound came from the bunk above me. Normally she was a rather restless sleeper. She would be thinking the same things I was. In spite of her relative inexperience, she knew the score. She would be half-consciously looking for me to do something, even though she knew there was nothing I could do that she couldn't handle just as well. Damn the guy that decided to implant that tendency in the younger crew members. I wished there was something I could do to reassure her enough to nullify the effect, but there was nothing. She knew the score. She knew that mechanically we would either make it or not make it. She knew that it was psychologically impossible for two people conditioned to married life in space to continue to exist in sanity in any other relationship. Recombination had been pounded into us since we first began training. We were lucky in a way. There was only one possible recombination. Yeah, lucky. Helena Donnelly was a good kid, the best. But she was just that, a kid. If we didn't make it, she'd never live to be old enough to vote. She'd been in training since she was fourteen. I'm almost thirty-five. I don't look it. Space doesn't age you that way. But it's all there. I could have recombined with Belle Leonard. It would have been awkward, but I could have done it. Helena could have recombined with Ed Travis without too much trouble. But this way... If we didn't make an honest recombination soon, not just a going through of motions, all the training and conditioning in the solar system wouldn't be able to prevent us from feeling the terrible sense of loss that normally comes with the death of a loved one. I was beginning to feel it already. Helena spoke once while we poked through the wreckage the next day. She said, I found the rest of the welding torch. It works. She didn't have to. I could see the cloud of steam from half a mile away. When we returned to the tractor, she took off her helmet and went through the motions without any hesitation, but obviously without feeling any more than I did. Just the slightly damp contact of cold lips. I'm not tired, she said. I'll start driving. 
She put on her helmet and climbed down through the airlock. I hung up my helmet and started to peel off the rest of my suit, then stopped and went to the forward window. I tried to imagine a certain amount of grace in the movements as she clambered up the side of the cab and got in through the hole I'd cut in the crumpled roof. But I'd never known anybody who could move gracefully in a spacesuit. Except Mary. Helena was not graceful, not even a little. I watched her start the engine and warm it carefully, constantly checking the instruments. There isn't much that can go wrong with a closed-cycle mercury vapour atomic, even when the reaction is catalytically maintained to keep size and weight down. But if anything did go wrong, it would probably stay wrong. We didn't have any spare mercury. After we'd been moving for about fifteen minutes, I went aft and checked the dozer. It was riding nicely at the end of a tow bar that had been designed to pull the trailer it was supposed to have ridden on. If it would just stay there. I watched for a while, then finished peeling off my suit and crawled into my bunk. I still couldn't sleep. It took me an awfully long time to wake up. When I made it, I found out why. I'd only been asleep an hour. I knew it was too good to last, I said. What blew up? Dozer brakes jammed, she said. Something wrong with the tow bar. That was fine. Perfect operation for twelve days. Twenty-six hundred miles covered. Then it had to give trouble. I rolled out of the bunk. Well, I didn't think we'd even get this far. Any leaks? She shook her head. Fine. That bar was a nightmare of pressure-actuated hydraulics. Very small, very light, and very precision. I wouldn't dare to go into it very deeply. Helena moved quietly to the other end of the compartment while I struggled into my suit. It had been that way ever since we started. We'd never tried to go through the motions after that one ineffectual attempt. So far, it hadn't mattered. Driving required all our attention, and after ten hours up front, there wasn't much problem involved in sleeping, no matter what we had on our minds. Now it would matter. That bar could take a long time to fix, even if I didn't go in very far. Helena would be just sitting around, watching. If she was my wife, it wouldn't have mattered. She waited until I was through the lock before she followed. There were normal tread marks for a hundred feet or so behind the dozer, then several hundred feet of shallow ruts. She'd disconnected the dozer brakes and then moved forward and stopped slowly, using the brakes on the tractor itself, to see whether the trouble was in the bar or in the actuators on the dozer. I checked the actuators, brushed out some dirt and sand, and reconnected, then tried to drive away. The brakes were still jammed. So? she inquired. So we take the bar apart. The tech orders were in Ed's head. Don't I know it? I didn't think you knew anything about this stuff. Anything specific, I mean. I don't. Would you think you can fix it? No, but I can't make it any worse. She laughed abruptly. True. How long? Five minutes, five days, I don't know. No. Yes. Oh. She turned and went back inside. I relaxed very slowly, much too much talk again, and all about the much too obvious. We could just as well have wound up at each other's throats. We still might. I pulled off the outer layers of my gloves and turned up the heat in the skin-thin layer remaining. The bar was still jammed when I got it back together sixty-seven hours later. Well, disconnect the damn things and let's move out. We've wasted enough time already. Helena's voice rasped tinnily inside my helmet, 
barely audible over the gurgle of the air compressor on my back. I already had the left brake actuator off when she spoke. For a fraction of a second I wanted to go up front and slap her full head off, then I caught myself and disconnected the right actuator and climbed onto the dozer. From now on, one of us would have to ride it, braking with its own controls when necessary. Let's go, I said, and then without thinking I added, and be sure you give me plenty of warning when you're going to put on the brakes or turn. I was getting as bad as she was. She put the big tractor into gear and pulled out, unnecessarily roughly it seemed to me. Of course, it could have been the bar. The next day we hit the rough country. Rough for Mars, that is. Just a lot of low, rolling hills running at odd angles to each other, with an occasional small outcropping of rust-red, eroded rock to make things interesting. We'd known it was there. It was clearly visible through the thousand-inch run Goddard. An X-mountain range, they told us. Not enough of it left to give us any trouble. They couldn't see the rocks, and they didn't know we wouldn't be travelling according to the book. It was obvious to both of us that riding the brakes on the dozer was a rougher job, and called for the quickest reflexes, which I had. Also, Helena had a hair-fine control over her voice, which I didn't have. Long before we hit the hills, I knew exactly how much braking she wanted from the way she asked for it. We couldn't have coordinated better if we'd been married for years. In spite of that, it was amazing how little ground we could manage to cover in fifteen hours, and how little sleep we could get in the other nine and a half. Helena stuck to the valleys as much as she could, which saved the equipment, but not the time. She couldn't avoid all the hills. Every so often we'd run into a long, gradual rise, which terminated in a sharp drop-off. The tractor wasn't safe at an angle of over forty degrees. It took anywhere from half a day to a day and a half for the dozer to chew out a slot that the tractor could get down. That was hard enough on us, but having to talk so much made it even worse. We were usually all but at each other's throat at the time the day's run was over. I usually spent three or four hours writhing in my bunk before I finally dozed off. I very seldom heard Helena twisting about in the bunk above me. The hills ended as abruptly as they began, after less than two hours driving on the thirty-fourth day. We still had almost eighteen hundred miles to go. "'Clear ahead!' Helena called back. "'How fast!' We both knew we couldn't possibly make it in the forty days we'd hoped, and that if we did, it wouldn't do us any good. We'd used up slightly over six days' worth of fuel for the dozer cutting slots for the tractor. There would be a balance between time and fuel that would give us the most possible days to use the dozer, when and if we got there. "'What's the active tank reading?' I asked. Point four. Add that to the three inactive tanks, plus the two in the dozer, plus the auxiliaries, plus the one remaining salvaged extra strapped to the dozer's hood. Split it all up in terms of average consumption per mile at a given number of miles per hour. Balance it against miles to the landing site, days left to L day, and dozer average consumption per day. Ten minutes later I called her and asked, Can you take an extra hour of driving a day? If you can, so can I. You've got the rough seat. I knew it was bravado. I did have the rougher ride, but she was a woman, and not a very big one at that. On the other hand, I didn't there assume anything but that she meant it. She was just itching for a chance to blow up in my face. OK, I said, sixteen hours a day, an average fourteen miles an hour, if your fuel consumption indicates more than point two over cruising, let me know. We covered another two hundred and one miles that day. On the thirty-fifth day, we covered two hundred and thirty-one miles. 
On the 36th day, we covered 224 miles. On the 37th day, we had covered 207 miles in the first 14 and one half hours. There wasn't any warning, either in external physics signs or on the tractor's instruments. One minute we were rolling along like a test run at the proving grounds, and the next a 400-foot stream of mercury vapour under pressure was coming out the left side of the tractor. It lasted only a few seconds. That was all it had to. I sat and stared for several long minutes, blinking my eyes and trying to see something besides a pure white line. I heard Helena climb slowly down from the cab and go up through the airlock, yet I really didn't hear anything at all. Finally, I got down and turned on my suit light and took a look at the hole. There wasn't much to see. The hole was no bigger than a small lead pencil, and I probably wouldn't have been able to find it in the dark if it hadn't been surrounded by a slowly contracting area of white hot metal. We were lucky. We were incredibly lucky. If that mercury had come out at an angle either one degree higher or lower than it had, we'd have been minus a tread or a chunk of the tractor's body. I didn't let myself think of how much good that was going to do us without an engine or what could keep us from each other's throats now. I snapped off my light and went inside. There was certainly nothing we could do tonight. Helena hadn't even taken off her helmet. She was sitting cross-legged in the middle of the floor hunched over, with her helmet buried in her hands as she might have buried her face in them if her helmet hadn't been in the way. When I got my own helmet off, I could hear her muffled sobbing. I didn't think, I just reacted. I reached her in one short stride and hauled her to her feet by her helmet. I twisted it a quarter turn to the right and jerked it off. I caught her by the collar as she staggered backwards and slapped her hard across each cheek, with my open palm on the left, backhanded on the right. I let go of her and she slumped back to the floor. "'Snap out of it, kid,' I said harshly. "'It isn't that bad.' I turned away from her and began to pull off the rest of my suit, starting with a heavy, armoured outer layer of my gauntlets. I had the inner layer half off before she finally spoke. Marsh? Yes. I'll kill you for that. You frighten me. I'm not kidding. I know you're not kid. You're just not thinking straight at the moment. You wouldn't be here if you were the type that could actually commit suicide when it came right down to the fact. We're dead already. Then how do you expect to kill me? It would be fun trying, Marsh. It finally hit me, and there was asinine, childish, and getting nowhere in a hurry. Hell, kid, I said. We've still got an engine in the dozer. It can be done. Maybe not neatly, but it can be done. Sure, she sneered. Sure it can be done. The dozer must have almost half the power of this hulk. We'll get there all right. We'll get there about the time the people upstairs pile up on the landing strip that isn't there. Then we can use the dozer to give them a good Christian burial. Hell, Marsh, there's no sense trying to do it that way. That hole can't be very big. If we take the mercury out of the dozer and add what we can find landing about on the sand, then pour it back in and weld the hole shut, we'll be all right. We'll get there a day or two later, but that won't be nearly as bad as if we try to tow with a dozer. Then we can swap mercury again and use the dozer. Couldn't be any simpler than that. Like a fool, I tried to be logical. How long do you think that weld would hold, kid? And then where would we be? Right where we are now, only maybe a few miles closer. We haven't got anything to lose, and we've got everything to gain. That was the start. In the course of an hour and a half, we covered every possibility and impossibility of the situation. Whatever one of us brought up, the other argued against. We talked like crazy. We were. When it finally penetrated that we'd both known everything we'd covered before we started, 
I said bluntly. Shut up. Go to hell. I suppose I will eventually. Should I expect to see you there? No. I'm sure it can be arranged, I said as I got up. You're not going to, she asked, suddenly really alarmed. No. By that time she was on her feet too. I spun her around and forced her to the floor. Then I tied her hands behind her back with some wire that had been lying on the floor behind me. I didn't try to tie her too tightly, just tight enough to be sure she couldn't get at the knots. She didn't resist nearly as much as I had expected. I repeated the process on her ankles, then gagged her to stop the insane conversation, and put her in her bunk. Then I turned out the lights and crawled into my own. It never occurred to me that there were dozens of things she should cut herself loose with just lying around the compartment. I awoke and threw my arm up from sheer instinct. I grabbed something soft and half heard a metallic clatter behind my head. There was a weight on top of me, and then the weight and I were on the floor, locked together with a blanket between us. Full consciousness was slow in coming, in spite of the shock of the activity. It seemed better somehow to just stay in that halfway state and enjoy it without knowing why. Finally, gradually, it penetrated that these were the motions that we were going through, but that we were not just going through the motions. This was for real. A nasty question followed the thought. If this was for real, why did she keep wriggling and twisting all the time? The answer was close behind. She never had been able to hold still when her husband held her. It seemed ages before we both realised how unsatisfactory it was to be separated by that blanket, and release each other and lay apart, with the blanket half on me and half on her. After more ages, I got up and turned on the lights. There were certain formalities that really should be observed. While I pulled on the outer skin of my spacesuit, I wouldn't be outside long enough to need any more. Helena quietly picked out the large wrench she dropped at the head of my bunk and put it back in the case it had come from. Love and hate are separated only by the thin edge of a coin. Flip it, and it can come up either way. I picked up a sterile specimen tube and a thin small sheet of metal, locked my helmet in place, and went out. It took me a little longer than I'd expected to find a reasonably large blob of mercury, but I made up for it by getting it into the tube on the second attempt. I was just beginning to feel the cold when I got back to the tractor. Helena had the specimen preservation kit out and open. I sealed the mercury in transparent plastic, made a ring from a piece of wire, bonded the mercury to it, and coated the whole works with more of the transparent plastic. It wasn't much, but... Then we got out the Bible. Later, we set up a double bunk. We didn't set the alarm. That was our honeymoon. Neither of us said a word in the morning. Actually, it was past noon. We didn't have to. There was only one thing we could do that made the slightest sense. I got out the welder and burned off the tractor's cab that went underneath and cut through the mountings on the useless engine and everything else that wasn't an absolute essential. Helena dumped everything movable and non-essential from inside. Shortly before dusk, I tossed the now useless welder on top of the other junk and climbed onto the dozer and pulled out. There weren't any brakes on what was left of the tractor, but that would have to not matter. We were going to have to drive round the clock, or not get there in time. A bulldozer is not a fast vehicle under any circumstances. Logically, I couldn't see that we had much chance of covering 1,100 miles in that rig, without having to make at least one stop quick enough to collapse the tow bar and land the tractor on top of the dozer. Emotionally, I couldn't believe a word of it. I knew we were going to get there. 
we did. Forty-eight days after the crash, I drove through the blackened edge of the northernmost marker area and parked just inside its southern tip. When I came up through the airlock, Helena was looking out what had been the forward port of the tractor, which now faced the area we would have to make into a landing strip. When I had the inner layer of my suit half off, she spoke for the first time since we'd been married. We made it, Marsh. I joined her and looked out into the dusk. It was going to be rough, but we could do it. Not quite, I said. We've still got that strip to chew out. She was silent a moment, then said, tightening her arm around me, I know. I said, we made it, Marsh. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!